Hello, everyone. I'm Comron. And I'm Billy. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors. Today, we will be discussing Book 1, Chapter 4 of Memories of Ice, a novel in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is Part 2 of our coverage of this chapter. And this podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it's most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Just know that Comron and I know that this series is the best fantasy story ever written, and we're just approaching this from a purely fanboy point of view and no literary critique. Just love. We'll be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that haven't read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. A quick warning, today's episode contains descriptions of extreme violence and is not recommended for children. Our show is listener supported. If you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate it. You can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad-free episodes on Patreon Weekly. Also, we'd really like to hear from you, and we really mean that. So send any feedback or comments you've got to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. I have a quick addition. It's not particularly relating to this chapter, but coming up, we're going to be using this term a lot. The Mibe, I've been doing the listen slash read. The, he says Mibe. Okay. So if anyone has any idea how this is really supposed to be, man, uh, please reach out to contact at horserockproductions.com. <laughs> I'm thinking of the name Phoebe, right? but I can't think of any other examples of words that end like that off the top of my head. Yeah, I, I, I got no idea. <laughs> so I was like, okay. Because the next chapter in particular, we talk a lot. There's a lot of her. So I'm like, okay. So that, that will come to forefront next week. Okay, great. I didn't mean to start the show off with a pre-warning for, ne for next week, but it's a pre-edition for next week, Homer. There you go. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, chapter four, part two. We pick up the chapter with Perrin immediately after Dujek updated him on the news of his family. As darkness arrived, Perrin stood atop the vast barrow. He had managed to leave the encampment without running into Whiskey Jack and the bridge burners. Night had a way of inviting solitude and he felt welcome on this mass grave with all its echoing memories of pain, anguish, and despair. He thought, among the dead beneath me, how many adult voices cried out for their mothers? Death and dying makes us into children once again, in truth, one last time. There in our final wailing cries. More than one philosopher has claimed that we ever remain children, far beneath the indurated layers that make up the armor of adulthood. Armor encumbers, restricts the body and soul within it, but it also protects. Blows are blunted. Feelings lose their edge, leaving us to suffer not but a plague of bruises. And after a time, bruises fade. He tilted his head back and stared skyward, blinking against the pain. The tautness of his flesh wrapped around bones like a prisoner's bindings. He thought, but there's no escape, is there? Memories and revelations settle in like poisons, never to be expunged. There are no gifts in suffering. Witness the tistandee. Well, at least the stomach's gone quiet. Building, I suspect, for another eye-watering bout. I guess he's temporarily distracted from the usual stuff that's eating him alive as he processes this new source of bad news. Right? I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing. I feel bad for him just hearing this bad you know, news. I don't think he was too shocked by the parents. I think the this, this stuff with Felicity is probably more troubling to him, wouldn't you think? Yeah, of the two between Tavora and Felicity, I think he's very confident in Tavora's ability to take care of herself mm -hmm. and navigate the world without the parents. Felicin has always been coddled, it seems, so yes. I could understand his concern there. Yeah. The city of Pale flickered to the south, like a dying hearth. Far to the west rose the hulking peaks of the Maranth Mountains. Perrin slowly realized that his folded arms now gripped his sides, struggling to hold all within. He was not a man of tears, nor did he rail at all about him. He'd been born to a carefully sculpted, cool detachment. In education, his soldier's training only enhanced. He thought, if such things are qualities, then she has humbled me. Tavora, you are indeed the master of such schooling. Oh, dearest Felicin, what life have you now found for yourself? Not the protective embrace of nobility, that's for certain. Boots sounded behind him. Perrin closed his eyes and thought, no more news, please. No more revelations. Whiskey Jack said, Captain, and settled a hand on Perrin's shoulder. Perrin said, a quiet night. Whiskey Jack said, we looked for you, Perrin, after your words with Dujek. It was Silver Fox who quested outward, found you. Whiskey Jack withdrew his hand and moved to stand alongside Perrin, also studying the stars. Perrin asked, who is Silver Fox? Whiskey Jack rumbled, I think that's for you to decide. Frowning, Perrin faced Whiskey Jack and said, I've little patience for riddles at the moment, sir. Whiskey Jack nodded, eyes still on the glittering sweep of the night sky. 
He said, you will just have to suffer the indulgence, Captain. I can lead you forward a step at a time, or with a single shove from behind. There may be a time when you look back on this moment and come to appreciate which of the two I chose. Perrin bit back a retort, said nothing. Whiskey Jack handles this situation so compassionately. A lesser person would have berated Perrin for his tone and insubordinate words right there. Oh, absolutely. Whiskey Jack is the commander we all wish we had if we were Marines or in the military. Heck, if we, he, if we, he's the boss we all wish we had. The big brother, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's a heck of a leader. That's a fact. Yeah. Whiskey Jack went on. They await us at the base of the Barrow, as private an occasion as I could manage. Just Mallet, Quick Ben, the Mibe, and Silver Fox. Your <laughs> I can't do it, man. I, be, I can't do it. Your squad members are here in case you have doubts. They've both exhausted their warrants this night to assure the veracity of what has occurred. Perrin snapped, What are you trying to say, sir? Whiskey Jack met Perrin's eyes and said, The Reavy child, Silver Fox. She is Tattersail reborn. Perrin slowly turned, gaze traveling down to the foot of the barrow, where four figures waited in the darkness. And there stood the Reavy child, a sunrise aura about her person, a penumbra of power that stirred the wilder blood that coursed within him. He thought, Yes, she is the one older now, revealing what she will become. Damn it, woman, you never could keep things simple. All that was trapped within him seemed to wash through his limbs, leaving him weak and suddenly shivering. He stared down at Silver Fox and said, she is a child. He thought, but I knew that, didn't I? I've known that for a while. I just didn't want to think about it. And now, no choice. Whiskey Jack grunted. She grows swiftly. There are eager, impatient forces within her, too powerful for a child's body to contain. You'll not have long. Heron interrupted and with a dry tone said, before propriety arrives. He didn't notice Whiskey Jack's start. Perrin went on, fine for then, what of now? Who will not but see me as a monster should we even so much as hold hands? What can I say to her? What can I possibly say? He spun to Whiskey Jack and said, this is impossible. She is a child. Whiskey Jack said, and within her is Tattersail and Nightchill. Perrin exclaimed, Nightchill? Hood's breath. What has happened? How? Whiskey Jack said, questions not easily answered, lad. You'd do better to ask them of Mallet and Quick Ben, and of Silver Fox herself. Perrin involuntarily took a step back. He said, speak with her? No, I cannot. Whiskey Jack said, she wishes it, Perrin. She awaits you now. Perrin said, no. His eyes were once again pulled down slope. He said, I see Tattersail, yes, but there's more. Not just this night chill woman. She's a soul taken now, Whiskey Jack. The creature that gave her her Reavy name. The power to change. Is this something he's just aware of? That she's a soul taken? Do you think? I believe so, based off of the line of questioning that Whiskey Jack has right here. Okay. He does seem to be aware of things that normal people aren't. So yeah, he must have some sensitivity that he's displaying. Because that's what I was thinking. Because I'm like, I don't think he was told that. He can see things nobody else can see. Do things okay. nobody else can do. <laughs> okay. What was that? The six demon bags? <laughs> 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 is that my, what that was uh, yes oh my good gracious you sank my battleship with the six demon bag reference it's <laughs> terrific it's like it's, it's terrific playing it's like we well, have six demon bag it's like you know <laughs> Oh, gracious. Dude, that's a fantastic line, too. <laughs> I want to know, yeah, it, just six demons or will that whole, like, 12 minor demons? Is this, you know, <laughs> mm. is this an assortment? Is this imperial demons? You know, uh, what, what kind of demons exactly are we talking about here? That's a good question. You that's never know. Question. But it'll hold six. <laughs> <laughs> but Quick Ben only had the little vial that holds one, but they're like one-off uses. Right. You know? Sacrificial vessels. Yeah. Whiskey Jack's eyes narrowed. He asked, how do you know, Captain? Perrin said, I just know. Whiskey Jack said, not good enough. It wasn't easy for Quick Ben to glean that truth. Yet you know. How, Perrin? Perrin grimaced and said, I felt Quick Ben's probings in my direction when he thinks my attention is elsewhere. I've seen the wariness in his eyes. What has he found, Commander? Real quick, to your question, how can he even sense Quick Ben questing out in his direction? That's yeah. the statement that indicated to me that he was seeing more. Right. Because it's not like he has some affinity for magic. Yeah. He can see the Matrix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, basically. Whiskey Jack said, Opon's abandoned you, but something else has taken its place. Something savage. His hackles rise whenever you're close. <laughs> and given Quick Ben's history with Shadow, mm. who can blame him? Right? That's, that's <laughs> too funny, man. 
Perrin smiled and said, Hackles, an apt choice of word. Animander Rake killed two hounds of shadow. I was there. I saw it. I felt the stain of a dying hound's blood on my flesh, Whiskey Jack. Something of that blood now runs in my veins. Whiskey Jack's voice was deadpan as he asked, What else? Perrin said, There has to be something else, sir. <laughs> Whiskey Jack said, Yes. Quick Ben caught hints. There's much more than simply an ascendant's blood to what you've become. Whiskey Jack hesitated and said, Silver Fox has fashioned you a Reavy name. Jen Isand Rule, Perrin repeated. Jen Isand Rule. Whiskey Jack said, it translates as the wanderer within the sword. It means, she says, that you have done something no other creature has ever done, mortal or ascendant, and that something has set you apart. You have been marked, Gano is Perrin, yet no one, not even Silver Fox, knows what it portends. Tell me what happened. Perrin shrugged and said, Rake used that black sword of his when he killed the hounds. I followed them into that sword. The spirits of the hounds were trapped, chained with all the, all the others. I think I freed them, sir. I can't be sure of that. All I know is that they ended up somewhere else, no longer chained. Whiskey Jack asked, and have they returned to this world? Perrin said, I don't know. Jen Isand rule. Why should there be any significance to my having wandered within that sword? Whiskey Jack grunted. You're asking the wrong man, Captain. I'm only repeating what Silver Fox has said. One thing, though, that has just occurred to me. He stepped closer and said, Not a word to the Tistandee, not Corlat, not Animander Rake. The Son of Darkness is an unpredictable bastard, by all accounts. And if the legend of Dragnapur is true, the curse of that sword of his is that no one escapes its nightmare prison. Their souls are chained forever. You've cheated that, and perhaps the Hounds have as well. You've set an alarming precedent. And yes, that's quite alarming. If Rake used that sword on all the threatening individuals for thousands of years, it seems like it would be the equivalent of a holding cell for all death row inmates that have ever been executed. And then all of a sudden they have a way of getting out. Yeah, that sounds like a television show. I know Reaper. <laughs> it's where souls okay. escape from hell. And you have a guy that's bounty hunting for hell. Oh my good gracious, it's hilarious because it's actually a Kevin Smith thing he produced for CW for a while. It's quite funny because he's the son of the devil. And he hunts souls reluctantly, escaping from hell, and is almost killed all the time. I'm reminded of that, just escaping hell all the time. It's like, and so it's a, yeah, that would be bad. <laughs> mm -hmm. From what little we've seen of Rake and his use of that sword, he does not seem that eager to go whipping it out. But we saw him whip it out a couple times in gardens. You know, I don't know what to make of that. I mean, it doesn't, he doesn't seem to take it lightly. I believe it was mentioned in Gardens of the Moon that he has reduced using it as of late okay he used to use it quite a, a bit more <laughs> <laughs> he's kind of he's kind of relaxed in his old age about his three hundred thousand year mark he's kind of starting to chill out a little bit <laughs> yeah i don't want to say too much right now mm. i'm not sure if there's anything behind the motivation to stop using it as much I seem to recall that the immense pressure that this sword exerts on the surrounding everything it's like and i'm curious if the more that he put in there does it get more unwieldy <laughs> like he tech not heavy but tech Technically, but you know, kind of harder to wield. The more that is in there, the fuller it gets. Is there a limit? Possibly. I know it's a, a big, great burden on him. Yeah. Killing all the people was like, oh, oh, this gets harder to. The, each time I use it, it becomes harder to wield. It's like a black hole. Or something. Yeah. Something like yeah, it's just real tough. Yeah, it's just brutal. Can't, no one can wield it but him. I yeah. don't think Draconis might be able to. Might be able to. Yeah. Yeah. Because he did make it. Perrin smiled bitterly in the darkness. He said, cheated, yes. I have cheated many things, even death. He thought, but not pain. No, that escape still eludes me. Perrin said, you think Rake takes much comfort in the belief of his sword's finality? Whiskey Jack said, seems likely, Gano is Perrin. Does it not? Perrin said, aye. Whiskey Jack said, now let us go down to meet Silver Fox. Perrin said, no. <laughs> <laughs> this obstinacy. It sounds like some recent conversations with my eight-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> Uh oh <laughs> something that did not happen that most assuredly did happen <laughs> i'm trying to remember it might have been about going to jujitsu and there was not a desire to comply okay <laughs> i think that's what it was all right yeah all right well. <laughs> Fail to comply will not be allowed in this house, sir. It was a long conversation that was <laughs> challenging. You try and navigate it reasonably. Right. And the decision is made. It's, by it's, the it's, it's, it's already made. It's already made. It's gonna happen. We just want yeah. you to, we want you to be a little bit more excited about the fact that well, you're gonna be doing this and whether you like it or not, you got one. 
Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Whiskey Jack growled, damn you, Perrin. This is about more than just you and her, all starry-eyed. That child possesses power, and it's vast and and unknown. Kalor has murder in his eyes when he looks at her. Silver Fox is in danger. The question is, do we protect her or stand aside? The High King calls her an abomination, Captain. Should Caladan Brood turn his back at the wrong moment? Perrin interrupted. He'll kill her. Why? Whiskey Jack said, he fears, I gather, the power within her. Perrin said, Hood's breath. She's just a... He stopped, realizing the venality of the assertion. He thought, just a child? Hardly. Perrin said, protect her against Kalor, you said. That's a risky proposition to assume, Commander. Who stands with us? Whiskey Jack said, Corlat, and by extension, all of the Tistandi. Perrin asked, Anamander Rake? Whiskey Jack said, that we don't yet know. Corlat's mistrust of Kalor, coupled with a friendship with the Maib, has guided her to her decision. She says she will speak with her master when he arrives. Perrin asked, arrives? Whiskey Jack said, aye, tomorrow, possibly early, and if so, you'd best avoid him, if at all possible. Man, I'll tell you what, when I read this, I was taken back to the feeling I had when I was a kid, knowing I was in trouble, and my dad would get home from work to deal with (laughs) Mm-hmm. with the discipline aspect mm-hmm. of it. <laughs> my, what's funny is my parents had a very strict regimen of how discipline functioned in my household, which is a great thing. As an adult, I see this, you know, but as a child, you don't see it that way. But, you know, it was the, basically the initial punishment was mom. And I may have mentioned this for me and my brother had our own switches above our door. We had our own. Oh, boy. Yeah. And so you went in the room for about... It's probably 15 minutes, but my word, it felt like forever. Then she'd come in and give you the licking. And if it took, and it was, you know, it's like, then that was all there was. But, you know, if there was some of that, like, obstinate, shall we say, <laughs> oh, it was on. And it's the last licking I ever got. <laughs> we wouldn't be having this conversation if I have not forgotten this. I've never forgotten this was my from my father. It's the last one I ever got. <laughs> it's a bad one. <laughs> As a bad now, I'm not saying my old man tried to kill me or nothing like that, but it's, I was wearing shorts that day. Let's just say it was a mistake. I that was the last time I got them. So, what would trigger the additional inputs from the father? Were you just like so? I can't remember. I'm assuming it was my my, my mom talks about. I in particular was almost impossible to punish. It was like, okay, sure, whatever. Yeah, I just, mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. just take it and whatever. And I was a cost counter. She says I was the one that's like I would be like. I can take that. I can, I can afford to pay that as a discipline to do what I'm going to do. <laughs> and so she says, and it was really when I turned 16, that's when I, we lived in, I grew up in a small town in McKinney, which was, you know, about 20, about 30 miles north of Dallas. You had to have a license to go anywhere in that town. So when I turned 16, that became the leverage was the car, mm-hmm. you know, that was the leverage. It's like, that's when I, but it took me being 16 really to them to get a handle on being able to, you know, get a hold of me. Cause it was like, I just didn't care. Yeah. <laughs> just didn't care. So I hope I don't have too much of that. Yeah. Me too. I- I'm hoping so too, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's amusing now as an adult, when I look back on it, but it's hard to deal with because oh, you can't word, get yes. through to them, you know, no, just like, no. Oh. being that child that was that way. I sympathize, sir. I'm sorry. I'll be praying for you. If you'd like that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, the kids are getting into their teenage years. The older two are pretty good. It's the younger ones that are a little bit more. I told you about my mother. My mother's theory in life about raising. I said, you know what? I said, you know, all she raised was boys. She was the only woman in the house. And she's like, I love it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I'd rather raise boys. Boys are way easier, even including me. It's like, it's still easier because by the time it's like boys do settle down about that age 16 you know 15 16 17 they kind of start to chill out a little bit get that some of that you know real stupid craziness out of them they're going to do some other stupid stuff but it's you know what i'm talking about and uh it's like but that's when the girls really get sassy as my mama said Mm. i don't think i could have lived with that that's what i was worried about i always said i wanted four boys right and then i was blessed with a daughter yes i was afraid ultimately is what it was i get that they have a lot of power over the father yes especially when they're young and raising them through the teenage years was another thing i was worried about you know preparing them for the world hopefully they listen you never know how it's going to turn out i think a good thing for you is the fact that she's got three brothers (laughs) that keeps her probably more grounded in some ways than uh, some others shall we say (laughs) All right, moving along. Moving along. Perrin nodded and thought, one meeting was enough. He asked, and the warlord? 
Whiskey Jack said, undecided, we think, but Brood needs the Reavy and their veteran herds. For the moment, at least, he remains the girl's chief protector. Perrin asked, what does Jujak think of all this? Whiskey Jack said, he awaits your decision. Perrin said, mine? Beru Fend, Commander. I'm no major priest, nor can I glean the child's future. Whiskey Jack said, Tattersail resides within Silver Fox, Perrin. She must be drawn forth to the fore. Perrin said, because Tattersail would never betray us. Yes, now I see. Whiskey Jack said, you needn't sound so miserable about it, Perrin. Perrin thought, no, and if you stood in my place, Whiskey Jack? He said, very well, lead on. Whiskey Jack said, it seems we will have to promote you to a rank equal to mine, Captain, if only to circumvent your confusion as to who commands who around here. <laughs> <laughs> I love how this relationship is evolving. It's hilarious. Oh, yeah. Oh, me too. And especially because in a weird way, I never think about this till you and I converse. Think about this. He was a little boy at the start of Gardens of the Moon, Perrin was. And he saw these fellows. He probably had some hero worship of them a little bit. And here he is, like, keeping company with them. That's got to be pretty cool, man. You would think that there'd always be something there that kind of keeps that distance when you meet your heroes. Yeah. I do wonder if he's just been through so much that he has had it. He is up to his neck. He's like, I'm done. I don't care what anybody says. You know what I mean? Because yeah. the mortal world is one thing, but then mm -hmm. he, he's dealt with gods. He's yeah. died and come back. So I think that next level kind of got him a little bit. He's close to a nervous breakdown. Yeah, but also I think it moved the needle on what he thought of humans versus gods, right. probably. I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, he started swimming with the sharks real quick. Though I do think that if he was in Lacine's presence, he'd probably be pretty respectful still. Uh, yes, I would imagine so. She commands respect. Yeah, she's like... <laughs> When we used to get those audits at Fry's, and then we had the head guy that was in charge of all the audit people. I don't want to say his name, but you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. It was like <laughs> the Empress is coming or something. Yes, you, know? yes. you just get it, all nervous. I'm waiting for the, it's like the Imperial Death March. I'm waiting. It's like, it's, that's what it's like, dude. You feel like the stormtroopers in white waiting for these guys coming here. Like, crap, is Vader on that ship or not? It's like, uh -huh. <laughs> that's actually probably a better analogy because in this case, Randy Fry or one of the Fry brothers coming to the yeah. store would have been like the Emperor coming. You yeah, know? yeah, very much so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but the fear was there of this guy oh, that would come around yeah. for the audits. Yes. What did they used yes. to call that? They had a name for it. Uh, Mopar. It's Mopar. Yeah, Mopar. Mopar. <laughs> Which was odd because I worked in the auto industry kind of, you know, I had a yeah. mechanic shop and that's Mopar. You're like, wait, what? Yeah, Chrysler. Yeah, it, it stood for something. I can't remember what it was. I'm assuming it had to do with the stuff that was your butt is on the line is somewhere in that word Mopar. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You better make sure those planograms are done. Is it is it the, <laughs> is it the anal retention test at the back? Is, 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 is something about that just to keep your job, keep your butt in line? I'm sorry, I don't know. <laughs> I just remember it for because I only became aware of that when it became the LP side, and it was difficult because there was no dodging my guy. If you were LP on the day he was there, dude, he was in your office forever hanging out and he's cool but you have that pressure of one of the california boys sitting in your office <laughs> while you're hanging there trying to have a good time but you're like well this is not really this is not awkward you know it's like yeah it's like being on a work date with your dad or something like that it's like, <laughs> my word it's like <laughs> yeah it's uh you can't show your true work face yes we are taken to brood's camp their arrival was a quiet, stealthy affair, leading their mounts into the encampment with the minimum of fuss. Few Tistandi remained outside their tents to take note. Sergeant Ansi led the main group of bridge burners towards the crawl to settle in the horses, whilst Corporal Picker, Dedaran, Blend, Trots, and Hedge slipped away to find Brood's command tent. Spindle awaited them at its entrance. Picker gave him a nod and the mage wrapped in his foul smelling hair shirt with its equally foul hood thrown over his head, <laughs> turned to face the tied down entrance flap. He made a series of hand gestures, paused, then spat at the canvas. There was no sound as the spit struck the flap. He swung a grin to Picker, then bowed before the entrance in invitation. Did I read that correctly? Is Spindle's hair shirt, in fact, a hair hoodie? <laughs> um, yes, it, it, it is, in fact... <laughs> A hair hoodie. Hedge nudged Picker and rolled his eyes. There were two rooms within, she knew, and Brood was sleeping in the back one. She thought, hopefully. 
Picker looked around for Blend and thought, damn, where is she? Here a moment ago, two fingers brushed Picker's arm and she nearly <laughs> leapt out of her leathers. Beside her, Blend smiled. Picker mouthed a silent stream of curses. Blend's smile broadened, then she stepped past, up to the tent entrance, where she crouched down to untie the fastenings. <laughs> we begin to see where Blend gets her nickname from. Mm -hmm. What a handy ability. <laughs> to just disappear from view. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty rough. I just can imagine her almost peeing her pants on that one. It's like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I'll tell you what. I was playing Elden Ring, and mm -hmm. I got jump scared real bad by wow. a rat. Uh, they have these big rats and i was on some beams in this tower high up in the air so i there's not a lot of room to dodge or anything and okay. i had been dealing with one in front of me and then all of a sudden one ran up the beam behind me and i yelped nice my kids saw me they were cracking up that's great oh my gosh that's hilarious <laughs> i liked that it. it made you yelp though that's that's a good game it's a good game yeah it's pretty good picker glanced over a shoulder Deteran and trot stood side by side a few paces back both hulking and monstrous at Picker's side, Hedge nudged her again, and she turned to see that Blend had drawn back the flap. Picker thought, all right, let's get this done. Blend led the way, followed by Spindle, then Hedge. Picker waved Deteran and Trotz forward, then followed them into the tense, dark confines. Even with Trotz at one end and Deteran at the other, with Spindle and Hedge at the sides, the table had them staggering before they'd gone three paces. Blend moved ahead of them to pull the flap back as far as she could. Within the sorcerer's silence, the four soldiers managed to maneuver the massive table outside. Picker watched, glancing back at the divider every few moments, but Brood made no appearance. She thought, so far, so good. This is so high stakes. Mm. They are absolutely insane for doing this. Love the bridge burners. And this is an absolute core memory for me. I think the reason being is a lot of these names were mentioned in Gardens of the Moon, right outside of Pale, some of the, you know, the names, uh, Dedera and Spindle and all these guys, but we didn't really meet anyone except Hedge and, you know, the Fiddler and those other guys that we've been traveling with for the most part. But this is kind of where they really come to life as a group for me, as a unit. You know, they really gel right here because we're going to see some of these folks quite a bit this book. And I really particularly like this bunch of because they are a funny bunch. Yeah, seeing the group dynamics is hilarious. Yes. I knew your, your love for the bridge burners from the series because you'd always check on my progress when I was reading this the first time. And this is kind of, I think I may have probably even said some of that to point because this is where they really came as a group to me as a whole they really start to come together You're like oh, i love these guys another thing i just thought of here they're having so much trouble moving this thing mm. think of what it took in a swamp to get this thing out oh my word the mott irregulars stealing it while in combat yes while in combat yeah <laughs> that adds to the legend of the mott irregulars yes it does <laughs> Picker and Blend added their muscles in carrying the table, and the six of them managed to take it 50 paces before exhaustion forced them to halt. <laughs> to my point. My word. <laughs> Good gracious. Spindle whispered, not much further. Dedaran sniffed and said, they'll find it. Picker said, that's a wager I'll call you on. But first, let's get it there. Hedge whined to Spindle, can't you make this thing any lighter? What kind of mage are you anyway? Spindle scowled, a weak one. What of it? Look at you. You're not even sweating, Picker hissed. Quiet, you two. Come on. Heave her up. Now, Hedge muttered, speaking of heaving, as amid a chorus of grunts, the table once again rose from the ground. He said, when are you going to wash that disgusting shirt of yours, Spindle? Spindle said, wash it? Mother never washed her hair when she was alive. Why should I start now? It'll lose its luster. <laughs> Hedge said, luster? Oh, you mean 50 years of sweat and rancid lard? Spindle countered, wasn't rancid when she was alive, though, was it? Hedge said, thank hood, I don't know. Picker said, will you two save your foul breath? Which way now, Spindle? Spindle said, right, down that alley. Then left, the hide tent at the end. Dedaran muttered, bet someone's living in it. Picker said, you're on with that one, too. It's the one the Reavy used to lay out Tist and D corpses before cremation. Ain't been a killed Tist since Darujistan. You know, I got to say, Picker sounds like a degenerate gambler. She's tried to bet every single person she's spoken with since the book began. She, she does kind of come across that way. But well, for the most part, a lot of them do come across as kind of a bunch of degenerates in because they're so crazy and just without restraint, shall we say? They're just so unhinged. 
<laughs> because they're crazy. I mean, they're just crazy. And, and I understand why blowing stuff up for a living, close encounters with almost blowing yourself up lots of times, living through it, probably does something to you. I'm sure they've had their head rattled a number of times, even though they've had it healed. I'm sure, yeah, these guys are punched. This is the punch drunk ones of the bunch. <laughs> mm. But also beyond that, they all are pretty heavy into gambling. It's just Picker is the one that's always trying to bet people. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because she's. Uh, for, how many did she say between here and the tent? It's like two, uh, bet, two. But yeah, it's real quick. Like, bet you that. Okay, bet you that. Dude, anytime, yeah. anytime something said, mm-hmm. can bet on it. We gonna bet. On- she's trying to bet Munug. That's true. <laughs> That's true. I'm sure there was another one at least somewhere yes. in there. Oh, good gracious, yes. I don't think we see her without betting. <laughs> <laughs> Hedge asked, "How'd you find it anyway?" Picker said, "Spindle sniffed it out." Hedge quipped, "Surprised he can sniff anything." <laughs> Picker said, "All right, set her down. Blend the flap." The table filled the entire room within with only an arm's length of space around it on all sides. The low cots that had been used for the corpses went beneath, folded and stacked. A shuttered lantern was lit and hung from the center pole hook. Picker watched Hedge crouch down, his eyes inches from the table's scarred, pitted surface, and run his blunt, battered fingers lovingly across the wood's grain. He whispered, beautiful. He glanced up, met Picker's eyes, then said, call in the crew, Corporal. The game's about to start. (laughs) Grinning, Picker nodded and said, go get them, Blend. Hedge said, even cuts. We're a squad now. Spindle scowled and said, meaning you let us in on the secret. If we'd known you was cheating all that time. Hedge said, yeah, well, your fortunes are about to turn, ain't they? So quit the complaining. (laughs) Picker said, aren't you two a perfect match? So tell us, Hedge, how does this work? Hedge said, oppositions, Corporal. Both decks are the real thing, you see. Fiddler had the better sensitivity, but Spindle should be able to pull it off. He faced Spindle and said, you've done readings before, haven't you? You said, Spindle said, yeah, yeah, squirt, no problem. I got the touch. Hedge warned, you'd better. He caressed the tabletop again, then said, two layers, you see, with the fixed deck in between them. Lay a card down and there's a tension formed. And it tells you which one the face down one is. Never fails. Dealer knows every hand he plays out. Fiddler, trots growled, ain't here. His arms were crossed, and he bared his teeth at Spindle. Spindle muttered, I can do it, you horse-brained savage. Watch me. Picker snapped, shut up. They're coming. It was near dawn when the other squads began filing back out of the tent, laughing and backslapping as they jingled bulging purses. When the last of them had left, voices trailing away, Picker slumped wearily down on the table. Spindle, sweat dripping from his gleaming hair shirt, groaned and dropped his head, thumping against the thick wood. Stepping up behind him, Hedge raised a hand. Dude, he's about to get a papal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is. And what's even worse, they talk about how awful that shirt smells. Now it's drenched with his own sweat. It's like, oh my good gracious, it's got to be nasty now. <laughs> Yesterday, it was humid as heck here. Mm-hmm. And I took the kids to the park. For an hour, I walked with my rucksack on. Mm-hmm. And just that hour, I was ready for a shower. Let's just say, you know, Mm -hmm. you don't smell great. This guy has not watched this shirt ever. I cannot imagine what it smells like. Yeah, it's awful. It's it's (laughs) awful. Plus it had lard on it and stuff. I mean, (laughs) I'm sure it got dirt and oh, I'm sure it's covered in who knows what he's worn it for how long? 10 years, we said he's worn it for years. It's years. Yeah, years. Yeah. And it's like, oh, oh, dude. I mean, I'm sure it gets washed technically if, it, if they're marching in the rain in a way. How do you come up with an idea like this? What is the inspiration for this? Well, there's hair shirts. Have you ever heard of hair shirts? But they're not human hair, are they? They're horse hair or no, something. No, I think okay. it's I, I, maybe hair. I got no idea. But I mean, I've always heard the idea it was more of a penitent thing. I mean, I got something from, and I'm not trying to offend anybody, please, but I've always associated this more with the Catholics and their history. I don't know why. I, I think of monks in towers and hair shirt. Picker warned, at ease, soldier. Obviously, the whole damn thing's been corrupted. Probably never worked to start with. Hedge exclaimed, it did. Me and Fid made damn sure. Picker said, but it was stolen before you could try it out for real, wasn't it? Hedge said, that doesn't matter. I tell you. Spindle said, everybody shut up. He slowly raised his head, his narrow forehead wrinkled in a frown as he scanned the tabletop. He said, corrupted. You may have something there, Picker. He sniffed the air as if seeking a scent, then crouched down and said, yeah, give me a hand, someone, with these here cots. No one moved. (laughs) Picker ordered, help him, Hedge. Hedge said, help him crawl under the table. It's too late to hide. Picker said, that's an order, soldier. Grumbling, Hedge lowered himself down. Together, the two men dragged the cots clear. Then Spindle edged beneath the table. 
A faint glow of sorcerous light slowly blossomed. Then the mage hissed. It's the underside, all right. Picker said, brilliant observation, Spindle. Bet there's legs, too. Spindle said, no, you fool. There's an image painted onto the underside. One big card, it looks like. Only I don't recognize it. Scowling Hedge joined Spindle and said, what are you talking about? We didn't paint no image underneath. Hoods, moldering moccasins. What is that? <laughs> Spindle said, red ochre is my guess. <laughs> like something a bar gas would paint. We got our first instance of ochre in the book. Nice. Nice. Man, we made it to chapter four without seeing it one time. I have a feeling now that we're looking for it, we're not going to see it as much as we expect. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Also, Hood's Moldering Moccasins. That's a new one, isn't it? I don't recall hearing that one before. For some reason, I thought we had. Because I seem to recall you laughing about that previously. Okay. Um, I'm not really sure. I've heard rotted feet or something. Yeah. Real quick flashback to the hair shirt thing. It says that most people would, in our, in my context, I was thinking of a religious means people would wear it to punish themselves, wearing rough, uncomfortable cloth. I don't think they mean literally a hair shirt, but it's uh, trying to punish themselves to show they're sorry for something they've done. So it was penitent, a penitent type thing. Okay. I don't know why we would have a little, unless, you know, I'm assuming this is just Mr. Erickson's brilliant sense of humor. I'd be curious what the inspiration was for that. Yeah. Hedge muttered, or a Reavy. Who's that figure in the middle? The one with the dog head on his chest. Spindle said, how should I know? Anyway, I'd say the whole thing is pretty fresh. Recent, I mean. Hedge said, well, rub it off, damn it. Spindle crawled back out and said, not a chance. The thing's webbed with wards and a whole lot else besides. He straightened, met Picker's eyes, then shrugged. He said, it's a new card, unaligned, without an aspect. I'd like to make a copy of it deck sized then try it out with the reading picker said whatever hedge reappeared suddenly energized he said good idea spin you could charge for the readings too if this new unaligned plays true then you could work out the new tensions the new relationships and once you know them spindle grinned and said we could run another game yeah <laughs> get around groaned i have lost all my money picker snapped we all have as she glared at the two staffers i said it'll work next time you'll see spindle was nodding vigorously Blend drawled, sorry if we seem to lack enthusiasm. Picker swung to the bargast and said, Trotz, take a look at that drawing. Trot sniffed, then sank down to his hands and knees. Grunting, he made his way under the table. He said, it's gone dark. Hedge turned to Spindle and said, do that light trick again, you idiot. Spindle sneered at Hedge, then gestured. The glow beneath the table returned. Trotz was silent for a few moments, then he crawled back out and climbed upright. Picker said, well? Trotz shook his head and said, Reavy. Spindle said, Reavy don't play with decks. Trotz bared his teeth and said, neither do Bargast. Spindle said, I need some wood and a stylus. He went on, ignoring everyone else, and paints and a brush. They watched as he wandered out of the tent. Picker sighed, glared one last time at Hedge, and said, hardly an auspicious entry into the seventh squad, Sapper. Ancy's heart damn near stopped when he lost his whole column. Your sergeant is probably gutting black-livered wood pigeons and whispering your name right now. Who knows? Your luck might change and a demon won't hear him. Head scowled. Ha, ha. Dederen said, I don't think she's kidding. Head snapped. Fine. I got a cusser waiting for it. And damned if I won't make sure I take you all with me. Trot's smile broadened and he said, team spirit. <laughs> he grunted. All right, soldiers, let's get out of here. <laughs> You know, one thing I was thinking about with this was there's a lot of people going in and out of this tent <laughs> right? and they're Malazans. A little suspicious. Yeah. And they're trying to be incognito after stealing Brood's table. Now, to be fair, it was Hedge's table originally. True. But it was offered to be returned and yes. they said no. Well, Whiskey Jack said no. I'm sure he's not sanctioning all these attempted <laughs> no, cheating no. gambling things no no he's a commander he can't have this stuff going on he knows it does but he's got to say no out loud to it at least we go back to perrin perrin and silver fox stood apart from the others watching the eastern sky grow light with streaks of copper and bronze through the awkwardness of the hours just past stretching interminable as a succession of pain and discomfort in perrin's mind emotional exhaustion had arrived and with it a febrile calm he had fallen silent, fearful of shattering that inner peace, knowing it to be nothing but an illusion, a pensively drawn breath within a storm. He thought, Tattersail must be drawn forth. The first meeting of their eyes had unlocked every shared memory, and that unlocking was an explosive curse for Perrin. I'd like to take a moment to discuss the nature of Perrin and Tattersail's quote-unquote relationship, if you can call it that. Unless I'm forgetting something, their connection seemed related to proximity, and shared experience they had both just lost 
things or he had yes. been recovering from his injuries more than anything else. I didn't see yeah. a buildup of rapport and the dance back and forth that you generally see attempting to get with somebody. Yeah. I'm like you. I, inf I inferred a relationship of boredom slash convenience in a locked room. Yeah. So not too much leading up to a relationship. Yes. Okay. So the next thing I thought about was Perrin was really young when this all took place. Sure. I could see that fling as a fairly impactful relationship for someone with his life experience. Now, if you look at Tattersail, who had lived three lifetimes, basically at that point, how many long-term relationships did she have during that time period? I'm assuming several major impactful relationships were likely in there. Sure. And I don't see how this relationship with Perrin could have been anywhere near as impactful to her as it was to him. Yes. And even then, like I said, Perrin, actually that relationship with her wouldn't have been that long ago. Oh, yeah. Good point. I mean, this is what, months? Two months since the end of Darujistan, but okay. there was some gap in time between Pale. Let's say a year. Okay. Okay, maybe eight months to a year. But I agree, I got nothing from that either. And the final thing that I thought of was Tattersail isn't the only entity that's in here. Yeah. So given Perrin may not have been as important to her, at least we haven't seen it. Yes. You know, maybe he was the greatest love she ever had in her life. I don't know. I just never saw that in the story. Right. Given that we have an unknown level of attachment from Tattersail towards Perrin, and then there's other entities in there with Tattersail, it's really a long shot to try to assume that Perrin meeting up with her is going to bring Tattersail to the fore. I agree wholeheartedly. And to speak to the whole thing. I think I'm going to summarize here. Guys. I feel like you feel this way to some extent. I feel like this romance was kind of shoehorned in there after the fact. Mm. The romance only seems to originate from this book. I know the ending of Gardens of the Moon with the Reavy and Perrin, and then even younger Silver Fox slash Tattersail. But I recall no pining, no, you know, lost love. Oh, my Lord, she's gone. You know, uh, you know. Uh, none of that. Well, to be fair, when he found the pillar of fire. Yes. He was upset about it. He, he was. And when he met her, it was shocking to him when she was the child and he had dodged all the lances of the Reavy. So yes. I will give that part. We were seeing from his side, at least, that there was some level of effect. He was hurt by her loss. That being said, my issue, I think, really stems from the Tattersail side. We never really got a good view of her feelings towards him. No, because... Tattersell is gone relatively early and made into this amalgam, which we haven't don't even see until the third book, and we don't really even really know her yet. We know who supposedly resides within, but we don't really know that. We don't know them yet. Are they at war with themselves? Are they just a unified is it an amalgam? Is it a little bit of this, a little bit of that? I don't know. Yeah, and I think another thing that adds to my skepticism with the Tattersell piece is she was in that situation ship with Callet. Yes. <laughs> right where she's like nice, de dude. denying i mean this is what people call these unclear relationships now where it's there's not a commitment really right now maybe though is it because maybe there is now something because they're both something a little different than they were when they met previously and that's all they're grasping on to each other in this storm of what's going on and not neither one knowing what's going on within themselves. I think you summarized it pretty well in that it does seem like we jumped through a lot of stuff that we normally get visibility into. He takes time to build relationships out most of the time. I think it's the absence of Tattersail, her dying so early. He didn't have time to really show us her side of the picture towards Perrin. Yeah. Because with everybody else, I think we get a pretty good idea of how they feel about each other through extended yes, dialogue and their actions towards each other. It could just be from absence of her viewpoint. I guess also that stuff about her being uncommitted to Callet and yeah. pretending like he didn't mean anything to her when he obviously did. Yeah, I don't, yeah, that kind I of agree. stuff. Situation shit. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's great i like that that's funny oh. this week on as Burn sleeps <laughs> parent thought 
a child, I face a child, and so recoil at the thought of intimacy, even if it had once been with a grown woman. The woman is no more. This is a child. But there was yet more to the anguish that boiled within Perrin. Another presence, entwined like wires of black iron through all that was Tattersail. Nightchill, the sorceress, once lover to Bellardan, where she had led, the Thelomen had followed. Anything but an equal relationship, and now, with Nightchill, had come a bitter, demanding presence. He thought, bitter indeed, with Tashran, with the Empress and the Malazan Empire, and Hood knows what or who else. She knows she was betrayed at the enfilade at Pale, both her and, out there on the plain, Bellardan, her mate. Silver Fox spoke, you need not fear the Talani mass. Perrin blinked, then shook himself. He said, So you have explained, since you command them. We are all wondering, however, precisely what you plan with that undead army. What's the significance of this gathering? She sighed. It is very simple, really. They gather for benediction. Mine. He faced her and asked, Why? She said, I am the flesh and blood bone caster, the first such in hundreds of thousands of years. Then her face hardened. She went on, But we shall need them first, in their fullest power. There are horrors awaiting us all in the Panyan Daman. Perrin said, the others must know of this, this benediction, what it means, and more of the threat that awaits us in the Panyan Daman. Brood, Kalor. She shook her head then said, my blessing is not their concern. Indeed, it is no one's concern but mine. In the Talani I'm asked themselves. As for the Panyan, I myself must learn more before I dare speak. Perrin, I have told you these things for what we were and for what you, we, have become. He thought, and what have we become? No, not a question for now. He said, Jen Isand rule. She frowned and said, that is a side of you that I do not understand. But there is more, Perrin. She hesitated then said, tell me, what do you know of the deck of dragons? Perrin said, almost nothing. But he smiled, for he heard Tattersail now, more clearly than at any other time since they'd first met. Silver Fox drew a deep breath, held it a moment, then slowly released it, her veiled eyes once again on the rising sun. She said, The deck of dragons, a kind of structure imposed on power itself. Who created it? No one knows. My belief, Tattersail's belief, is that each card is a gate into a warren, and there were once many more cards than there are now. There may have been other decks. There may well be other decks. He studied her, then asked, You have another suspicion, don't you? Silver Fox said, Yes. I said no one knows who created the deck of dragons, yet there is another entity equally mysterious, also a kind of structure, focused upon power itself. Think of the terminology used with the deck of dragons, houses, houses of dark, of light, of life and death. She slowly faced him then said, think of the word finest, its meaning, as the Talani mass know it, is hold of ice. Long ago, among the elder races, a hold was synonymous with a house in its meaning and common usage, and indeed, synonymous with warren, where resides a jagut's wellspring of power, in a finest. She paused again, searching Perrin's eyes. She said, Tremorlor is trellish for house of life. Perrin thought finest, as in finest house in Darujistan, a house of the Azath. He said, I never heard of Tremorlor. Silver Fox said, It is an Azath house in seven cities. In Malice City, in your own empire, there is the dead house, the house of death. I appreciate the continuity in the naming conventions of these Azath. Yes, I agree. It's good to learn the true meanings behind these names. They are so fast. I'm so always intrigued by the Azath. I completely forgot that there were meanings to those names, and it was because they're in different languages that you didn't understand how similar they were in structure right i get it yeah perrin said you believe the houses of the azath and the houses of the deck are one and the same silver fox said yes or linked somehow think on it perrin was doing just that he had little knowledge of either and could not think of any possible way in which he might be connected with them his unease deepened followed by a painful roil in his stomach perrin scowled he was too tired to think yet think he must he said, it's said that the old emperor, Kelonved, and Dancer found a way into Dead House. Silver Fox said, Kelonved and Dancer have since ascended and now hold the House of Shadow. Kelonved is Shadow Throne, and Dancer is Cotillion, the Rope, patron of assassins. Perrin stared at her. He said, what? He didn't know. We found out along no. with Fiddler and Crocus in Dead House Gates. So for us, we've known it for over a year now. Wow. Yeah. And <laughs> right? so this is... Uh, yeah. Yeah, and when I first read this book, uh, this is where I started really becoming aware of the fact that this was, in fact, hack bending at the same time as Dead House, mm -hmm. or roughly on the same timeline. So, Silver Fox grinned. 
It's obvious when you consider it, isn't it? Who among the Ascendants went after Lucene with the aim of destroying her? Shadowthrone and Cotillion. Why would any Ascendant care one way or another about a mortal woman unless they thirsted for vengeance? Perrin's mind raced back to a road on the coast of Itkokan, to a dreadful slaughter, wounds made by huge, bestial jaws. He thought hounds, hounds of shadow, shadow thrones pups. From that day, Perrin had begun a new path, on the trail of the young woman Cotillion had possessed. From that day, his life had begun its fated unraveling. He said, wait, Kelanved and Dancer went into Dead House. Why didn't they take that aspect, the aspect of the House of Death? Silver Fox said, I've thought about that myself and have arrived at one possibility. The realm of death was already occupied, Perrin. The king of High House death is Hood. I believe now that each Azath is home to every gate, a way into every warren. Gain entry to the house and you may choose. Kelonved and Dancer found an empty house, an empty throne. And upon taking their places as Shadow's rulers, the House of Shadow appeared and became part of the Deck of Dragons. Do you see? Perrin slowly nodded, struggling to take it all in. Tremors of pain twisted his stomach. He pushed them away. He thought, but what has this to do with me? Silver Fox said, the House of Shadow was once a hold. You can tell. It doesn't share the hierarchical structure of the other houses. It is bestial, a wilder place. And apart from the Hounds, it knew no ruler for a long, long time. Perrin asked, what are the decks unaligned? She shrugged and said, failed aspects? The imposition of chance, of random forces? The Azath and the deck are both impositions of order, but even order needs freedom, lest it solidify and become fragile. Perrin said, and where do you think I fit in? I'm nothing, Silver Fox, a stumble-footed mortal. He thought, gods, leave me out of all this, all that you seem to be leading up to, please. Silver Fox said, I have thought long and hard on this, Perrin. Anamander Rake is knight of the House of Dark, yet where is the house itself? Before all else there was Dark, the mother who birthed all. So it must be an ancient place, a hold, or perhaps something that came before holds themselves, a focus for the gate into Kurald Galane, undiscovered, hidden, the first wound, with a soul trapped in its maw, thus sealing it. Perrin murmured, a soul. A chill clambered up his spine as he added, or a legion of souls. The breath hissed from Silver Fox. That's an interesting revelation. What type of wound, if it takes that many souls to seal the damage? Yeah, I didn't even think about it like that. That's really, I can't imagine. And I wonder, another question for that is, I wonder if wounds, now not big ones like I'm thinking there, but just we've seen a number of these already. So is this more commonplace? Or And I'm guessing that in what we suspect to be kind of a multiverse scenario, I would imagine statistically, It'd have to happen to a certain percentage, you know. We've seen it happen two or three times already. Yeah, I think it happens quite a bit. Yeah. Based on the description of Dark that she just gave, we've had some conversations, you and I, on a number of episodes wondering where Dark came into existence. Was it before, dragons, after, that kind of stuff. Yeah. This makes it sound like it was the first. It does. If that's the case, what I think happened is when she reached out for something else that created this rent and when light was introduced it created such a big rift that it was beyond anything that we've seen so far yeah that could very well be so in a weird way if dark is first would everything else in fact be alien i don't know that's an assumption on my part well mine was a hypothetical i said if dark is first where does light come from in that context yeah does it come into existence because she's looking for it was dark alone and then she says i'm lonely i want something else so how does light come about she reaches for it and it causes this rift maybe that's a really good supposition we're just going to go with that for the moment i guess because i have nothing better (laughs) we'll find out in about eight years when we read the karkinus trilogy right hopefully (laughs) i think he said he's gonna work on the third book in that which relates to shadow after this next book okay oh no the first one's good dude it's good (laughs) i'm not reading it because he's he's talking about making four of them now so i gotta wait till nice i will not wait years after reading the one it's not gonna happen it didn't hurt left hanging going well what's gonna happen next is you know it's okay (laughs) in that aspect i'm not doing it billy not doing a bill. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what if something happens to you before here and there and you don't have a chance mm-hmm. to? Yeah, that's a good point. Perrin continued, before houses, there were holds, both fixed, both stationary, settled. Before settlement, there was wandering, house from hold, hold from a gate in motion, ceaseless motion. He squeezed shut his eyes and said, a wagon burdened beneath the countless souls sealing the gate into dark. He thought, and I sent two hounds through that wound. 
I saw the seal punctured by the abyss. What has he done? I don't know. And I forgot that this much was spelled out right there in that sentence. <laughs> About the wagon burdened beneath countless souls, sealing the gate in the dark. Hmm. Some pretty important info. Yes, it is. So casually tossed out there. <laughs> uh-huh. Silver Fox said, Perrin, something has happened to the deck of dragons. A new card has arrived, unaligned, yet I think dormant. The deck has never possessed a master. She faced him and said, I now believe it has one. You. Whoa, that's a big responsibility. Right. Yes, it is. It's, uh, and, and what does that even really mean? Sounds like the Enforcer organization has just got a new <laughs> member in the Malazan universe. <laughs> so, uh... It... <laughs> So there are rules that must be enforced. So in the more wards of Walter Sobchak, so this is not Nam. This is bowling. There are rules. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I really appreciate how Mr. Erickson led us to this point via this conversation. Yes, I agree. And the master of the deck is such an interesting concept. Joking aside, there are rules. <laughs> Actually, not joking aside. Yes. There are rules that must be enforced. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, there, there are, are rules. <laughs> well, someone cares about them. Perrin's eyes snapped open. He stared at her in disbelief, then scorn. He said, nonsense, tatter, Silver Fox. Not me. You're wrong. You must be. Silver Fox said, I am not. My hand was guided in fashioning the card that is you. Perrin said, what card? She did not answer, continued as if she had not heard him. Was it the Azath that guided me or some other unknown force? I do not know. Jen Isand rule the wanderer within the sword. She met his eyes and said, you are a new unaligned, Ganoa's parent, birthed by accident or by some purpose, the need of which only the Azath know. You must find the answer for your own creation. You must find the purpose behind what you have become. I wonder how much room for interpretation is available to Perrin here. Do you think he has agency in this scenario or is this closer to fate and he has to act a certain way? I don't know. He's really in the dark here, not trying to be just using another thing to liken it to, but he's to me, he's like Peter Parker trying to figure out what's happening to him after he got bit by the spider. And he might have agency. He might have a lot of agency for that matter. Because my question is, could he might, you know, if he has enough imagination, could he not possibly be one of the most powerful entities out there? Well, we know the Warrens are very powerful. And the deck represents yeah. Warrens. So yeah. it's hard to say what this means, really. It is. Would you say Perrin is out of his element? <laughs> yes, I would definitely indeed say that he is out of his element, Donnie. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I set it up. You picked it up. You ran with it. That's exactly yes. what I was looking for. <laughs> Perrin's brows rose mockingly. He said, you set for me a quest? Really, Silver Fox, aimless, purposeless men do not undertake quests. That's for wall-eyed heroes in epic poems. I don't believe in goals, not anymore. They're not but self-delusions. You set for me this task and you shall be gravely disappointed, as shall the Azath. Silver Fox said, an unseen war has begun, Perrin. The Warrens themselves are under assault. I can feel the pressure within the deck of dragons, though I have yet to rest a hand upon one. An army is being assembled, perhaps, and you a soldier, are part of that army. Perrin thought, oh yes, so speaks Tattersail. He said, I have enough wars to fight, Silver Fox. Her eyes glistened as she looked up at him. She said, perhaps, Gano is Perrin, they are all one war. Perrin said, I'm no Dujek or Brood. I can't manage all these campaigns. It's, it's tearing me apart. Silver Fox said, I know, you cannot hide your pain from me. I see it in your face and it breaks my heart. He looked away and said, I have dreams as well. A child within a wound, screaming. Silver Fox asked, do you run from that child? He admitted, aye, those screams are terrible. Silver Fox said, you must run towards the child, my love. Flight will close your heart. He turned to her and thought, my love. Words to manipulate my heart? He asked, who is that child? She shook her head and said, I don't know. A victim in the unseen war, perhaps. She attempted a smile and said, your courage has been tested before, Perrin, and it did not fail. Grimacing, he muttered, there's always a first time. He had better get that attitude in check. Yeah, back to the my love statement. That kind of backs up my shoehorned theory a little bit, in my mind. Mm, hard to say what the motivations are there. I think he's on the right track. Yes, I hope so. Silver Fox said, you are the wanderer within the sword. The card exists. 
Perrin said, I don't care. Silver Fox countered, nor does it. You don't have any choice. He rounded on her and shouted, nothing new in that. Now ask Opan how well I performed. His laugh was savage. He said, I doubt the twins will ever recover. The wrong choice, Tattersail. I am ever the wrong choice. She stared up at him, then infuriatingly simply shrugged. Suddenly deflated, Perrin turned away. His gaze fell on the Mibe, Whiskey Jack, Mallet, and Quick Ben. The four had not moved in all this time. Their patience, damn it, their faith, made Perrin want to scream. He thought, you choose wrongly, every damned one of you. But he knew they would not listen. He said, I know nothing of the deck of dragons. Silver Fox said, if we've the time, I will teach you. If not, you will find your own way. Perrin closed his eyes. The pain in his stomach was returning, rising, a slowly building wave he could no longer push back. He thought, yes, of course, Tattersail could do no less than she has done. There you have it then, Whiskey Jack. She now leads and the others follow. A good soldier is Captain Ganoa's parent. In his mind, he returned to that fraught, nightmarish realm within the sword Dragnapur, the legions of chained souls ceaselessly dragging their impossible burden. And at the heart of the wagon, a cold, dark void from whence came the chains. He thought, the wagon carries the gate, the gate into Kurald Galain, the warren of darkness. The sword gathers souls to seal it. Such a wound it must be to demand so many souls. He grunted at a wave of pain. Silver Fox's small hand reached up to touch his arm. He almost flinched at the contact. He thought, I will fail you all. And thus the chapter ends. Mm, wow. Yeah, that was a good chapter for sure. Yes, it was. Real good chapter. For standout moments. I enjoyed the way Whiskey Jack handles the situation with Perrin, especially how he doesn't take Perrin's sassiness personally. Agreed. I really appreciate that about him. And I also appreciate the fact, especially as we neared the end of the chapter in particular, you see why Whiskey Jack kind of behaves that way too, because he needs to see a little bit about Perrin, because Perrin's also new to them, even though they, they know who he is, but what he has become is new to them as well. They don't know what to think, see, or do. They just kind of, let's just watch him wait. Yeah, good point. The whole sequence with the bridge burners stealing the table back from Brood's tent, beautiful. Mm, yeah, and again, a core memory. And like I said earlier, just kind of this due to them, that's where they really came to life for me. Or those names that were mentioned in the earlier books, you know, even it's, it's like, oh, here we are, we're, we're with them. And they're pretty, they're pretty outrageous. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I particularly enjoyed them attempting to run a game on it and losing all their money. And then how they reacted uh, afterwards, word. you know, Hedge was about to <laughs> slap Spindle. Oh, great stuff, dude. I agree. This is totally, really classic. I could see that scene so well, so beautifully done, so funny. The introduction of the mystery of the new card painted on the underside of the table. Yeah, that's really wild. And the fact of who it is. Yeah, finding out that Silver Fox painted it and that concept of the master of the deck being introduced. Really compelling like to know more yeah me too because i'm not really sure what this implies for parent but i look forward to discovering it together with you because we through some of our talks through the earlier books it's really helped cement some other ideas i was kind of vague on and i look forward to getting into more in this and seeing if we can s clear this up a little bit yeah i'm really picking up so much more going through it at this level of depth instead of just reading it because yeah. when i get in the zone and i'm reading it's fast and i'm not necessarily thinking heavily on everything that I'm seeing. Yeah, just consuming the words sometimes. Finally, Perrin refusing to take the burden that is placed on his shoulder, and we can see what's happening in his stomach as a result. Yeah, I'm just ready for him to get on board and stop hurting Perrin. You're killing yourself, man. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you just got to ride the wave. Yeah. All right, Billy, great job tonight. Hey, man, great episode. I love that chapter. Good chapter. You got any final thoughts before we drop off here? Well, other than the fact, I just love how we, you know, get the build up for the introduction to the characters, starting to get to know these people more and as and seeing all this stuff coming together. And even here in Silver Fox, that one little nugget of information she provided goes, maybe they're all one war is an intriguing mm. premise. Is it not, sir? It is. I was thinking about saying something, but I was like, ah, if I start getting in this conversation, I don't want to reveal too much. <laughs> right, right. I agree. It is an intriguing reveal, though. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. We'll see you all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us, and we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.